Hi, and welcome to our third edition of the Plant City Chamber of Commerce's Be Informed series. Um, like I said, this is the third edition. Uh, to everyone watching, if you haven't had a chance yet to see any of our videos, um, the, the first two went really well. I would encourage you to go back and, and take a look at those if you have time. Uh, but today we have with us um, State Senator Danny Burgess. So uh, Senator Burgess is, uh, first, thank you. Thank you for being here with us. We're so thrilled that you took the time to uh, to sit down with us and let everybody um, meet Danny today. Um, and that's really the goal of, of this interview today is to just get uh, let everybody have the opportunity to see kind of who you are as a person and kind of what your uh, what your political views are and and kind of what you see as the future. Um, first, let me thank our sponsors, our sponsors for uh, this this issue of Be Informed is um, the Plant City Airport. So thank you very much for uh, to the Plant City Airport for being one of our sponsors and for sponsoring um, this video today. Um, so Danny, just uh, to uh, excuse me, Senator Burgess, for for let me just introduce you, give uh, people a little bit of background on you, and then uh, we'll go from there. So first, sure. I think it's important for everybody to know that um, Senator Burgess was first elected to the Zephyr Hills City Council at the age of 18 in 2005. He served on the city council from 2005 to 2008. Um, and then he took a, a short hiatus to go, uh, go to law school and get his uh, law degree. Then he came back to Zephyr Hills and served as the mayor of Zephyr Hills from 2013 to 2014. In 2014, he got elected um, to represent District 38 in the state, the Florida House of Representatives as a state representative. He served there from 2014 to 2018. And at that time he was um, appointed as the executive director of the Department of Veterans Affairs by our current sitting governor. Mm -hmm. um, where he served from 2018 to 2020. And um, as you all know, he was recently elected as state senator for District 20 which uh, encompasses the city of Plant City. So that's why we wanted to give everyone a chance to meet you, uh, to meet their new senator. So Danny, tell us a little bit about, uh, why don't we start with your family? Tell us about your family. Absolutely, thanks Jake. And, and so Jake and I became fast friends when we served together in the Florida House of Representatives. So I got to know Jake around 2014. Already knew of Jake, but got to know Jake um, in 2014 and everything I had heard was very true. He was just uh, not only a fast friend, but the kind of person that you just want to gravitate towards and rely on and, and learn from. I appreciate from. that. This so, is about you, not me. I know, <laughs> but, but, but it's true. And, and I'm just Danny and uh, I'm honored to serve as your state senator. I'm honored to uh, represent Plant City. I can already tell in my limited interaction so far on the campaign trail that the Plant City Chamber not only has it going on, but y'all are like a lot of fun. And that's the best part. I, my, my local chamber here in Zephyr Hills where I've grown up is, is a blast too. And, and uh, it's, it's awesome to have, a, you know, another chamber in my life that is just like, you know, always looking for a good time and always working hard and always leaning in on some really awesome, innovative um, economic development and revitalization uh, type projects. So really look forward to working with y'all, getting to know y'all better and uh, being a part of the team. Um, so my family is obviously uh, who I am and what defines me like Jake and uh, my wife lives in East Hillsborough County. So that's kind of the layup. She's, she's a local. Um, she's from the Lithia area, grew up in the Fishhawk area, went to, um, went to Newsom High School, was one of the first graduates there. So very familiar with, uh, with the area and uh, excited to now represent it since so much of my uh, wife's side of the family, my family has come from East Hillsboro and Courtney kind of grew up being very involved in the East Hillsboro community and politics and things like that. So uh, really awesome to get to reconnect and spend a lot of time working on things and campaigning with some people that were, you know, at my wedding because of Courtney. So, so that's pretty special. Um, you knew, you knew her as Courtney Clem, Courtney Burgess, and I did bring her all into Zephyr Hills. I uh, she she loves it here, but uh, I'm sure she misses home too. Um, we're in Zephyr Hills, born and raised here, uh, so not too far from y'all. And uh, we are just excited to have the opportunity to go on this new adventure together. We do things together, like Jake and his family when they were in Tallahassee. We travel to Tallahassee together. We. Uh, actually are braving it in an RV this year. We, we went, instead of renting a place up there, we decided to go the RV lifestyle. Um, and why not have 
three kids and five people total in, in one small RV for 60 days straight. I mean, if you're already in the chaos, just embrace it even more and take it to the next level. So uh, we do this together. You'll be seeing a lot of us together, hopefully soon when we can all get together in person. And, um, you know, that's that's the best part of this job is making new friends and connecting with old friends and helping out communities. And, and that's that's what I really thrive and enjoy the most about this. So uh, you can you, you'll, you'll get to know our family well and, and hopefully become a part of it. So tell me about being elected to the city council at the age of 18. What's that like? Um, just just give us a little uh, glimpse into the window of what life was like as an 18 year old uh, Danny Burgess. Oh, and it was it was. It was interesting. I wonder what I was thinking sometimes. I'm grateful for the experience. Um, I was a freshman in college. Uh, I don't remember the exact moment I said, hey, I'm going to do this. But I do remember a lot of bits and pieces of, of that time. And, and from running for office to finding out, surprisingly enough, you were elected. Um, I, that was actually a shocker. And I think I remember looking at my dad and mom and saying, oh, what now? <laughs> you know, so it's, it's just hilarious looking back. But I, I learned quick. You know, don't go in thinking you know everything and, and don't be afraid to ask questions. And and I really my dad gave me that advice and I really took it to heart. And now, I honestly, to this day, it doesn't matter how old you are and how experienced you get. You got to carry that on. And you got to you got to kind of live by that model. Um, and so I do. And, and it's helped me avoid a lot of landmines in the process. So um, it was a good experience. It was certainly a learning curve. Um, I was definitely the young guy on the block. I was the youngest elected official in the state for sure. I don't know about the country, but it was, it, I had a lot to learn. I didn't own a home. I was just a freshman in college living in my parents' house. And, um, you know, but I, I was, I was energetic and I had ideas and I wanted to start now. And so I always encourage young people to, they don't have to run for office, but you know, you have a voice when you're young and, and you have an opportunity to make a difference then too. And so why not do it? And, and that was kind of my philosophy. And and it, it, was, it was an amazing time. I resigned to go to law school because I had to get a real job. And then I went into the Army. Um, and when we moved back from the D.C. area, um, after I came out of active duty training and my wife um, was up in D.C. working and then came back down to work for then your congressman, Tom Rooney at the time, um, and Dennis Ross, uh, both, she worked for both of them, we uh, came back and, and I ran for mayor of my hometown here in Zephyr Hills. And now that is a great job being mayor of your hometown, your small town. Oh my gosh. That, that was, those memories are some of the greatest I'll, I'll ever have. So um, you mentioned, and I meant to, to mention that in your introduction and I honestly forgot uh, you mentioned joining the army. Um, oh, yeah. Tell us about, and now you're still in the army and reserve, correct? I, I am. In fact, tomorrow starts my annual, uh, my monthly training. So I'm in the Army Reserve. I'm a captain. Uh, I got to suit up tomorrow and, and get to work early in the morning in St. Pete at our unit. So uh, it'll actually be our first time meeting in person since the pandemic really started. Our last in-person drill was March. So everything's been kind of virtual like anything else. But tomorrow uh, we're back to a three-dayer at, at our uh, at our unit. And uh, I hope I haven't, uh, I haven't lost too much of... Uh, a, a fitness level uh, since then. So I'm sure they're going to put us to the test. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. I'm a little nervous. I put on so, a few pounds since this pandemic. So should we call you Captain Burgess or Senator Burgess? Which is it? I prefer Danny. I prefer oh, Danny. Yeah. It's, yeah. Okay, good. So, but yeah, uh, my fate, look, the best, the best professional hat I get to wear is certainly being in the military. Um, awesome. It's, it's always been the one that I, you know, I always say they're going to have to kick me out. You know, I just I'll serve until I can't anymore. It's it's really it's an awesome honor to do that and to be a citizen soldier where you get to you get to, you know, have the best of both worlds. I have a civilian career. I live where I want to live. I don't have to travel around too much and, um, you know, have the opportunity to also wear the uniform and serve. Um, well, and thank you for your service. You know, I know that we all appreciate um, every member that that chooses to make that sacrifice and be a. Uh, to, to give up some of their personal life to go uh, be in the be in the service and um, protect our freedom. So thank you for that. Um, kind of moving. It's an awesome. It's an awesome honor. Thank you. And, and it's because of the people that I grew up who serve, you know, in my community and small you'll, plant city will appreciate this. I really believe that, you know, Zephyr Hill shaped me into the person I am. And, you know, whether it's our veterans groups or seeing their example and, and the, the, the leaders, realtors, chamber members, um, I kind of think that it helped me, you know, become the person I was. And, and I'm sure the same goes for Plant City and the folks who grew up there. Definitely. Um, so in 2014, um, as you've stated, we, we, uh, you got elected to the Florida House. Um, that's really when we got the chance to meet and get to know each other. 
Um, the, out of the, uh, the four year, years you spent there, what, what are some of the things, some of your proudest accomplishments or some of the, um, some of the things that you really enjoyed that you got the chance to work on in the, in the Florida house during those four years? So, you know, personally, obviously, as you know, we have, you know, the bills that we file and then we also have the, the legislation that we get to, to work on uh, in that process or learn about and as we move forward. And, and I'm, I'm really proud of a lot of the community stuff we were able to do. Um, you know, those are going to be hard, obviously, in times of COVID and the budget isn't as strong as it was in the past uh, because of this impact. But, but the community projects, the things that, that matter home, at home, um, you know, being able to assist there and maybe some, provide some matching funds and uh, stuff like that, economic development type projects, transportation roads, like State Route 56, for instance. I mean, I being a part of that and being the fruits of that labor and getting to travel down that road now and see how it impacted the traffic, uh, you know, in, in what was House District 38 when I was there. I mean, that. That's that's the kind of stuff that's it's validating. It lets you know that's why you do it, and and so those are those moments. And Jake, you know, you know, those moments can be few and far between. I mean, a lot of times you probably leave the chamber and you say, "Oh my gosh, you know, I have I really have I really been able to make a change here, or impact this?" Because there's so many cooks in the kitchen, there's so many moving parts, there's so much chaos, and, and you name it, right? And so, you know, those little glimmers, uh, you know, give you hope and keep you going. Um, but obviously constituent services is, is really important and probably the most important part of our job because you can help connect dots and fill gaps for people at home who are struggling, getting connected to a benefit or a service or, or uh, navigating the, the bureaucratic process, whatever it may be, or finding out what's available. And so that, that's, that's a big, awesome, exciting part of the job. But, you know, the piece of legislation, I think, that I, I look back on that I think probably had the biggest impact was direct primary care. And direct primary care, as you know, is is really a great alternative to health insurance and it enhances the relationship between the provider and the patient by allowing them to enter into a contract for monthly primary care for services as opposed to having to have a third party provider there in the middle, which uh, makes it easier for the doctor to spend more time with the patient. And it makes it a lot more affordable for the patient to be able to get that one-on-one -on -one care with the doctor. For instance, a single person, a relatively healthy single person, you know, would pay $50 a month and, and have unlimited, you know, scope of services defined in the contract um, that the primary care physician would outline. And, you know, for people who may not otherwise be able to afford or be on, say, a, a, a huge, you know, Blue Cross Blue Shield plan for whatever reason, or even small business owners who, um, you know, can't provide that type of uh, insurance coverage uh, that, say, a, a BCBS would, would, would have because of the costs, um, you know, even employers could go to this direct primary care model and pay for contractual services for their employees and allow the employer to provide that great benefit to the employee and everybody benefits that way. And you have healthier workers and, you know, you have a great benefit that an employer can provide that's at a much affordable rate. Um, so, you know, it really is awesome. It's great. It, it's not a one size fits all approach, just like anything else. I mean, you may have somebody with a lot of comorbidities who, you know, really shouldn't be on a direct primary care plan because of that. And so you also probably want to make sure you have a little bit of wraparound coverage that, you know, in case of a catastrophic incident, you can get to the ER and not be out of pocket $10,000. So, you know, again, it's, 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 it's all about ideas and moving the needle. And, and I think it, for a large portion of our uh, state, it, this did and could, and it's catching on pretty strongly. Um, you know, for, for instance, a family of five like mine and a family of six like yours, I mean, you know, we'd pay 150 a month for our entire family um, to, to receive com comprehensive primary care services with a doctor that participates in a direct primary care plan, which a lot do. Um, that's unheard of and, and, and amazing. And even if you added on a catastrophic policy, you probably are still under the $300 range, right? I mean, you know, so think about the affordability of that and what that can do. And it's just sure. raising awareness now and allowing people to get access to that. And it's the, same quality healthcare you'd have otherwise if you had the most comprehensive, expensive plan on the market. So, um, you know, from a primary care perspective, of course. So it's really, really beneficial. Awesome. Um, 2018, um, getting appointed to be the executive director of the Department of Veterans Affairs um, by Governor DeSantis. Um, tell me what that was like. That was a roller coaster. So it was obviously flattering and exciting and exhilarating and all the feelings you can imagine you'd have getting a phone call like that, asking if you'd consider joining the cabinet. But it was also overwhelming because I was just reelected for my third term. Um, 
by over 60% of the vote. And I felt like I had made, of course, my next two year obligation to my community that I know very, very well because it's my community that I've grown up in my entire life in East Pasco. And I really struggled with it. And Courtney can confirm this. Um, it was not an easy decision, not because I didn't want to join his team or be a part of that mission, but because I had already committed and equally loved the mission I was already in. And and so I, you know, I, I obviously by leaving, uh, there was a special election that came after that and everything, and it all works out in the end. But obviously we all know how the story ended. I did go, but I'm so grateful I did. I think the lesson learned for me in both taking the role at FDBA, but also, um, you know, now leaving FDBA to join the Senate and run for the Senate is, um, in life, I guess you don't have all the answers, but if the door is opening um, and you're not trying to pry it open, like, you know, physically swing that door open, uh, it seems to be opening on its own. Then, you know, I'm probably going to walk through it because, you know, I don't ever want to look back and wonder. I guess that's the big, th my big thing is, you know, I may not know for sure, but, you know, for some reason, this seems to be the direction I'm supposed to go. Um, and I don't want 10 years from now to look back and albeit maybe happy and, and glad I am where I am wonder like, should I have run for the Senate? Should I have served at FDBA? So I'm just going to make the most of the time that I have in front of me and, uh, and, uh, do the best I can for the time that I'm there. And, and, uh, I think the rest will work itself out. That's definitely a lesson I've learned over the past couple of years. Uh, and I think it's helped me to have a lot better perspective and, and to enjoy the ride a little more too. My time at FDBA was amazing. Um, the people I've served with are incredible. Here I'm a captain in the army and I'm in charge of everything from a two-star retired general down to a, you know, a colonel and lieutenant colonel and major. I mean, they, I, I would be saluting them if we were in uniform. So, you know, I, I learned so much there and we, we were able to do a lot of good stuff there too. And, um, you know, I, I know, uh, I know, I know there are some on this line probably that have a strong connection to the mission of FDBA uh, through family members, uh, Christine. And, uh, and, and the mission that is our veteran, state veteran nursing home. And, and so it was an honor to be able to help run the seven state veteran nursing homes that we have here in Florida that serve our veteran population. Um, that was a big, as you can imagine, with COVID. It was a very tough mission. Um, but we have a, an incredible team. Um, Christine's uh, sister, Marlise, is one of our home administrators. And she's, uh, she's just amazing. And, and uh, we, we got through it. And they're going to get through it. And we'll all be better for it. Well, and I'm sure that was a challenging aspect of the job with, um, I mean, we've, we've all been affected by COVID and um, to be the person that, that answers those questions when it comes to COVID and the state veterans homes. And uh, uh, we appreciate your service there as well. Thank you. It was challenging. We had quite a bit of outbreak, obviously, no matter what you do, you can't prevent it from coming in and we got through it though. I mean, everybody kept their calm. They were professionals. They showed their true colors in the, in times of crisis and everybody rallied and that's what it's all about. All right. So now uh, let's talk about the Senate. Some I've heard uh, the Florida house um, described like a well-oiled machine. I've heard the Florida Senate described as more like um, 60 individual islands, uh, 60 warlords all fighting against each other. Um, Tell me, I, I realize that that you've just been sworn in. Uh, you don't really have that experience yet, but uh, tell me what you expect. Um, I know we've all seen because of uh, COVID, last numbers I saw were looking at maybe a $5 billion budget hole. Um, what are your expectations for uh, this first year in the Senate? I know you, you're gonna be serving a two-year term in the Senate, and then you'll be up for reelection for a four-year term. Right because of redistricting. Um, but but give us an idea of kind of what you expect uh, in the Senate for the next two years. I think COVID is going to take, obviously, a, a primary um, front and center focal point as it should. I mean, you know, we have to be willing to rise to the mission of the day and the crisis of the day. And, you know, we come in with our priorities. But I think at the end of the day, um, what's happening in the world sometimes can take control of that, you know, whatever that crisis may be. And of course, we're in the middle of a pandemic. We're still in it still fighting it. The vaccine is hopefully on the horizon, but it's not quite here yet. And it'll take time for us all to adjust after that and see how the vaccine helps mitigate the problem. And so bottom line is we have to learn to operate in this in this new world. And, and we have to realize that it isn't just going to go away uh, and get back to you know the old normal anytime in, in the immediate future, just because of any particular development. It's going to be very measured. It's going to be very um, methodical and it's it's probably going to take some time. So we have to be prepared for that. Um, and, and we have to be willing to address that uh, from a business economic perspective. I just, I, I shudder to think of the, the impact that our 
community business owners have had because of this crisis, where we were and where we are now. Um, I'm inspired by the resiliency of our business owners and how they managed to make it through this. Uh, but unfortunately, not everybody did. Uh, and that just breaks my heart. It, it just, people were really doing well. People were thriving. And then this happened and nobody saw it coming. And um, you know, we have to we have to we have to be there as, as in government. I believe we, we, we should be there to help empower job creators, help um, help them navigate this uh, the way that they know how, you know, it's not government that's taken the, you know, the, the last dollar we have out of our pocket to take a risk and open up a, a business. It's, it's, it's you, um, you create the jobs. We don't, we just hopefully help you have a, a great uh, fostered environment that'll allow you to create those jobs. And so how can we help you in this time? And, and that's going to require some thinking. It's going to require some digging and it's, it's obviously the budget's going to be slimmer than it usually is, but thank God we in Florida, um, have been making some tough decisions for years now. Um, and Jay can validate this where we have our AAA bond rating, where we have a healthy reserve, where we have a rainy day fund um, and a savings account. We balance our budget. All those things matter. Um, and we're going to weather the storm far better than we otherwise would have because of those decisions in the past to be prudent. Um, other states just won't. They just, they won't. That's not a political statement, but they're not going to be in the position Florida's in because of the decisions they've made to, to spend more than they have. And thankfully, we don't do that in Florida. We can't. And so, um, you know, we will weather the storm better. It doesn't mean that we don't have challenges. It doesn't mean that we won't, um, you know, have a lot of struggles along the way. We are tourism economy. Um, so we obviously need to look at pillars of our economy and see how we can maybe enhance manufacturing and other pillars of our economy. Agriculture is, of course, a huge pillar of our economy. How can we make sure our ag community gets through this? Obviously critical in Plant City. Um, so there's lots of facets to what's about to happen. How do we make sure that we mitigate any impact of COVID liability um, on business owners? You know, make sure that there aren't frivolous lawsuits coming down the pipe to try to take advantage of, of, of this crisis. We can't have that. Um, you know, so we, we got to give uh, our business owners, you've been through enough. We got to give you the comfort you need to know that you don't have to be looking over your shoulder wondering what's about to come down from a legal perspective. So, um, you know, I believe in, in personal responsibility and our civic duty. And for me, uh, taking the appropriate safety measures, whether they work or don't, if there's a chance that I can prevent the spread by wearing a mask, then I'm going to wear the mask. I don't know. I don't know if the mask works or doesn't work. I'm not a, a scientist. I'm not a doctor. I'm a lawyer and, and, and I'm in the army. And, 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 you know, if I'm, if it's being recommended, then, okay. You know, if I can make sure that my family or my, or my community is, is, is you know, I'm not an asymptomatic carrier, then okay, I'll do that for now. You know, I'm going to do my civic duty. I'm going to do my personal responsibility. I don't, it doesn't necessarily mean that we should be mandating things. It just means that, you know, I, as an individual, I'm going to take up that, that mantle and I'm going to, I'm going to do what I can to do my part. Um, so we're, we are in this together. We're still in this together. Uh, it's, we're, we're going to have to learn how to keep sacrificing together. Um, and, uh, and, and we're all going to be better forward in the end. We're going to get through it when we're brought to our knees. We're all always at our best and rise up to meet the challenge stronger than ever before. And I believe that's going to happen now. Do you think, you know, the Plant City Chamber of Commerce this year, we, uh, we took our first, um, political stand on an issue, um, this was the first time we came out publicly um, in opposition to a political issue, particularly Amendment 2 that mm -hmm. was, uh, passed um, here in this last election. What What are your thoughts on uh, implementation of Amendment 2? Do you have any um, encouragement for businesses that, that are going to be affected by this? Do you see, are there, are there ways that we can... Um, that we can help mitigate the impacts of Amendment 2 on- You know, that, Jake, that's that's a great question. I had this conversation yesterday uh, with somebody. I, I said, you know what the amazing thing is, is, you know, with everything going on, obviously still with the presidential election down to the crisis that is COVID-19, I, 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 it's interesting that you don't hear more talk about the passage of Amendment 2 and the absolutely, I believe, damaging impact that's going to have on our job careers. Um, in a perfect world, we all want everyone to thrive, and we all want everybody to be able to to, to do their best and, and to to get, you know, the wage that is, they, they, they've earned, you know, in, in, in the process. And, and, and I just, I think this is a bad time to experiment on something like this. And, and what's done is done. 
you know, at this point, the amendment passed and it obviously is going to need to be implemented and, you know, similar to similar to how we had, we implemented the, you know, the medicinal marijuana amendment and the amendment four and, um, you know, uh, you name it, the other amendments that have come through the years. But this one really is something I'm reflecting on. It's going to be very, very hard as an individual to stomach this um, because of what it is going to do, not just in a good economy, which would still be troublesome for our job creators and for our businesses who actually make the job uh, that allows somebody to be employed and earn a, earn a good wage. Um, now in the middle of, of, of this crisis where for the first time and I don't anybody who's alive's memory, our economies have been shut down like they were for months on end and businesses are on their knees. I just can't stomach the fact that this happened right now. And, and I just feel terrible for our business owners and I feel terrible for the people they employ, the workers who this is uh, in theory supposed to benefit because ultimately what that is going to do is it's going to force business owners to have to lay people off and it's going to force people to have to not create jobs or worse, shut their doors because they won't be able to, to, to stomach this, this increase at this time. And so there are second and third order effects to everything. I am not a doom and gloom person. However, I just, I'm very much worried about what this is actually going to do to our economy, to our business owners, and ultimately to our workers who this is intended to benefit at this time. And I thank the Plant City Chamber for having the courage to come out against it. Um, I think that that was a good move. I think it was the smart move. Um, obviously, you have a legislature who is sensitive to the real world impacts that this is going to bring. And I don't have much more to add other than that. I think it's early, obviously, and, and there's a lot that's going to happen from now till then. I wish I could tell you more. Um, but those are the realities. I, I guess the little peace of mind and the takeaway from this for those who are concerned is knowing that we are concerned too. Um, and we will have that perspective, obviously, going into doing the job that we have to do uh, in doing our constitutional duty at this point. Sure. sure. Well, um, Danny, is there anything else that you think that um, our members or anybody who might be watching or later, is there anything else that we didn't talk about that you think we should know about uh, who is Danny Burgess? <laughs> well, um, uh, so... Gosh, I, uh, I we love Plant City for a lot of reasons, but you'll find us out there because uh, you have awesome uh, train watching uh, opportunities. My son is obsessed with trains. I'm, I find myself out there all the time, um, you know, long before running for office, just because that's where we like to, to, you know, go watch the Amtrak go by middle of the day or the multiple trains that end up actually heading towards Zephyr Hills. So we, we chase it down 39, uh, you know, after it leaves Plant City. And so uh, it's a special place for us, um, and, and I really look forward to serving you. Just know that I always have an open door. Know that, you know, even though we all don't agree on issues all the time, that I really approach what I do um, with an open mind and an open door. And I really do try to listen more than I talk. Um, and I believe God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason. And I, I keep that perspective. I love to hear other perspectives. Um, and, and I love to, um, you know, I love I love showing people that it doesn't always have to be what you see on TV, the divisiveness, the, you know, the lack of unity, the division, you know, just because we disagree. I believe that we can be in an opportunity to understand that we both want what's best for our community. And there may be a couple ways to look at that. Um, and so I, I promise to always have an open door to always be accessible. And I really look forward to working with our community partners out there who are watching, um, because, that, again, that is the best part of this job. Um, so really, really excited for this opportunity as we venture down this road together. Well, um, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. I know that uh, members of the chamber, members of our community are um, excited to get to know you a little bit better. I know I appreciate that our families have gotten to know each other and I'm, I'm excited about our community's um, chance to get to know you better uh, as well. So um, one more time before we go, I wanted to take the chance to thank our sponsor, the Plant City Airport. Um, for anyone watching this video, if you are not a member of the chamber, please consider joining the plant. As the chair of the government affairs committee here at the Plant City Chamber of Commerce, 
um, and provide, um, we hope that the chamber, as the chamber, we can be providing um, services for you that you don't even realize that we're doing, that we're fighting for you on the legislative level, um, in the local community, at the government level to uh, fight for small businesses. So I would encourage you to join the chamber if you're not already a member. Um, and last but not least, Senator Burgess, Captain Burgess, Danny, um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for taking the time today to meet with me. I hope you have a great day. Thanks, Jake. See you soon. Bye, everybody.